Our scripture reading for this morning is found in the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand, one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink of the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to him, the cup that I drink, that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right or at my left hand is not mine to grant. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those who they recognize as their rulers, lord over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But... Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be a slave to all. For the Son of Man not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. During this Lenten season, I have had our thoughts turned towards the questions that Jesus asked. He asks them not once, but he asks them over and over again in many different ways. What is it you want me to do for you? Now the question being asked today by the two disciples, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, or also known as the sons of thunder, Jesus is obviously off by himself, and they see an opportunity to address their teacher directly. Jesus, being the good teacher, does not ignore them, but instead engages them. James and John were two very unique disciples. Not in the fact that they were related. Not in the fact that they bring a sibling family dynamic to the disciples. How many of us have siblings? How many of us get along all the time with our siblings? Don't lie to me. (laughs) Better yet, don't lie to yourself and don't lie to God. You can lie to me all you want. (laughs) My sister and I have a very unique relationship because my sister is medically diagnosed as an aphetoid cerebral palsy, nonverbal quadriplegic. So our arguments are almost like a form of interpretive dance sometimes. But when she's not happy with me, she lets me know it. For someone who is nonverbal, she swears really well. (laughs) And whether I'm visiting her at her home or we're visiting at my house or we're talking over video chat on our phones and devices... If I say something that is, shall we say, less than comforting or falls into the bonehead category, she's very fast to let me know, and then we kind of disagree for a little bit. The term sons of thunder is a joke in the Gospels because that that basically takes their relationship and describes it as you have two brothers who argue and lock heads and butt heads an awful lot of the time. But Jesus called them. Called them to be one of his twelve. Called him to be part of the twelve primary individuals that he would teach directly, who would then take the message of the gospel out into the world. But James and John, along with Peter, made up the inner circle of the disciples. In those times when he said he took the disciples off by himself, There are special times when he says he took Peter, James, and John aside. So these two weren't just a couple of brothers that were called to be part of the twelve. They ended up being the right and left hand of Jesus 
in a lot of ways. So Jesus is off by himself, and they walk up to him and say, Teacher, Master, Rabbi, Jesus, we want you to promise that you'll do whatever we ask. Now this looks like an arrogant and presumptuous question. How dare they do such a thing? Are they taking care of their position and their office? And the answer is no. Because all throughout entire, Jesus' entire ministry up to this point, they have watched people come with real, genuine need. And Jesus grant their request. If it was to advance themselves or to blow up their ego or to basically keep them reestablished in the position of where they are of life, Jesus always went, no. But if there was a true brokenness, a genuine spiritual request, which an incredible majority of them were, Jesus always said, ask and I will do it. So here are James and John, the sons of thunder, part of Jesus' inner circle saying, hey, do something for us. And Jesus doesn't say, well, it depends on what it is. He doesn't say, well, let me hear it first, then I'll let you know. He doesn't, for lack of a better term, hedge his bet. He says, tell me what it is. What can I do for you? What is it that you want me to do for you? Well, we want to sit in the places of prominence in the kingdom. We want to be at your right and your left-hand side. I don't know if you're familiar with seating charts and power systems and how you lay them out for the world to see, but the most powerful place to sit next to a master is at their right-hand side. The second most powerful place is the left. They asked to be in the places of prominence. We really don't know why. Matthew and the other gospel writers who include this story don't tell us. And we actually have to keep in mind, the writers of the gospels and the writers of scriptures always give us the information that's important for us to focus on. So knowing why they were making this request is really irrelevant when it comes to Mark's gospel. They asked. Jesus said, well, are you really aware of what you're asking? And for me personally in my spiritual journey, especially in this Lenten season, that's the real rub. How many times do we go to God, go to the cross, go to Jesus, and say, God, I want you to do this for me, whatever it is. For weeks, months, I've been saying, God, heal my wife. And people have been saying, make this go away. And about a year ago, I kind of went, hmm, boy. I don't know if that's the right prayer. I don't know if that's the right request. Because sometimes what we have to do on our part to make those things come to pass is bigger than what we can handle. Or, real, actually more to the reality, more than we're willing to do. You see, with my bride, it wasn't make it better, make it go away. The prayer was to make it so she can manage. So that we and my son and our friends and our family can be as supportive as they can be, even though most of them are scattered throughout the country and throughout the world. Trust what the doctor says, ask the right questions, be vigilant. And in the times and places when we weren't, things didn't go so well. How often do we go to God and say, God, I want this, Jesus, I want this, and there is this response almost, this uneasiness that we get, and it's the Spirit saying, are you sure you're aware of the totality of what you're asking? It's not that God can't do it. It's going to do our part to work with God to let it come to pass. Nine times out of ten, we get caught up in our excitement. We're like gung-ho. We're not thinking, we're not hearing, we're not paying attention to the response. 
And when we're asked that question, can you do your part, the answer is, well, yes, of course we can. But that response calls us to break our day-to-day thinking, the routine of our minds, the routine of our actions, the routine of our sensory awareness and perceptions of life as we know it. It calls us to grow, to question, to think, and to be ready to receive that answer, which will not always come in ways that we're accustomed to. James, John, can you actually, do you actually understand what you're asking? Oh, yeah, yeah, we get it. We can do it. You almost hear an implication, and I realize I'm stretching here, but there's almost an implication of, well, we've journeyed with you this far. How much more do we need to do? And that's when Jesus drops the hammer. Are you aware of what I'm going to have to go through? Are you aware of what lies ahead? Have you not read the prophecies found, out, found in the Old Testament that talk about the Messiah, of how the Son of Man will be handed over, will be rejected, will be put up on a mock trial, will be punished, will be scourged, will be put to death? Do you not understand that the human element of suffering could be beyond what you understand and that you are going to have to go through things that you've never experienced before? Do you understand that? And that's when the rest of the crowd, the other disciples, the other ten, hear what's going on, realize what James and John is asking, and kind of go, who do you think you are, Jack? But instead of calling James and John out in that moment and publicly humiliating them, disciplining them before the twelve, he takes what's going on because not only have James and John made this request, but in the anger the disciples have revealed, hey, they want that place of prominence in paradise as well. Jesus then turns the situation onto all of them gathered and says, hey, wake up, this isn't a party. This isn't a picnic. We live in a world that is in a direct opposition to that which God wants to do. You come to me and ask, what do you want? What can I do? And I'm telling you, but there's some work that you have to do at the same time. Are you willing to do it? And sometimes that's just preparation for the answer. Are you willing to stop and focus and recognize that God did not create While he created us in his image, the world goes against that image every day. While God builds up, the world tears down. While God puts out peace, inequality, and justice, the world that we live in, in Jesus' day and today, seeks to promote the individual to have power and dominion over everyone so they're under their feet and under their footprints. And the reign of God the kingdom of God, the way of the Christian is to have everyone be equal in the eyes of God. Because God and God alone is the one who will choose who sits in the place of prominence. And if we want to be true servants and even be considered candidates, that seat, that position, that power, that control is not our quest It is see that we live the relationship with God that we claim to be living. To love those who would not be loved in this world. To forgive those that we would really like to tear apart right now. To allow ourselves to change our minds of direction and purpose. To allow God's presence and purpose and direction to be first and primary in our lives and everything else will fall into place because God will take care of it. That's the cup that Jesus drank from. And what's even more interesting and for me personally mind-blowing is he's saying this to Jews. People whom God chose to represent him and talk about him and share him and personify him to the world around them. They didn't 
do it. They got caught up on the rules and the power and what could it get them. They're going to be elevated above everyone else and everyone will be below them. They said they understood, but they didn't live it. And here is Jesus who has basically recognized this message and purpose that God has put before them, and he's embodying it. Every day, giving of himself. To the sick, to the starving, to the lame, to the broken in spirit. Even to the high official who calls for help, Jesus goes in the name of God, sharing God's love with a word, a touch, a teaching. He's telling James and John and the rest of the apostles that this isn't about you. This is about what God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit can do first in your life and then through your life into the lives of others and into the world. They thought that because they were part of the group and of the group, the inner group within the group, they were super believers. And hey, they're going someplace. But Jesus says, if you want to go someplace, then you need to first go and serve others. If you want to go someplace and be someone in the eyes of God, you need to make caring for your fellow man by carrying the message of the gospel to your homes, to your friends, to your places of work, to your places of play, and let them see that through you. Then, through that preparation, through that growth, through that journeying, God will recognize. And then we'll see what God will do. What is it that you want from God What is it that you want Jesus to do? How is it that you're wanting the Spirit to fill you and guide you? We have to first honestly answer that question and then recognize that there's work that we do to see that come to pass. We don't make it happen. We open ourselves to be molded so God can make it happen. That's what it means to journey in faith. That's what it means to grow in discipleship. That's what it means to have our spirituality formed, not by our preferences and our wills and our wants, but by opening ourselves up and letting God come and permeate us, fill us, reshape us, mold us, so we are able to recognize and follow God's guidance, God's wisdom, God's mercy, God's power unfolding. James and John did not understand the question they were asking, but Jesus did. Sometimes we think we understand the questions we are asking, but Jesus always does. And no matter how big or small or appropriate or inappropriate in accordance with the scriptures they could be, Jesus never rejects. He gives audience. He lends an ear. He pays attention. And always, always, always responds appropriately. What I mean by appropriately, I mean that which we need, not only in that moment, but in all the days to come. We come to the cross and lay our petitions. And Jesus says, what is it you need? And I'll do it. Sometimes we have to be willing to recognize that the answer is going to be, 
are you really sure of what you're asking? And are you willing to do what you need to do to open yourself up and receive the answer? That's what's going on here. It's not a rejection. It's not a punishment. It's a wake-up possibility for an epiphany. Which, I don't know about you, but I'm waiting to have happen on Easter. Because we cannot celebrate God's ability to break through all the barriers of our fears and let his light shine. Because that's what this journey takes us to. The light of Jesus. A light that not only shines and fills the world, not only a light that goes and shines in the darknesses of our own souls, but a light that shines through us. So the world will say, there's something a little different about you. And we say, yes it is. I walk with the light of Jesus shining through me. That's what I want. That's what I hunger for. That's what I fall down and mistakenly not do on a regular basis. But the beautiful and wonderful thing is God doesn't reject me in those moments. In fact, he helps me get up, helps me brush off, helps me take stock of what did I do And to learn from it. So hopefully, I won't do it again. But that's me. What is it that you want God to do for you? Willing to listen, willing to do it. What are we doing to allow that to take place? That's my thought for Lent on this day, as we look at James and John. Our closing song for today is... Shine, Jesus, shine. It's peppy, it's energetic, it's not meant to be a Lenten song, but we're at a place where we need to kind of have a small glimpse of what the future is.